We're continuing our series on victorious living. This is the book of Joshua, and we're almost at the end of the book. We're in chapter 22 today. We're in chapter 14 last week, but from 14 to 22, I'll explain to you what happened as we start the message. But before I start, let's open it with a word of prayer. Our Lord God in heaven, thank you for bringing us here together as a family. We join our hearts today with gladness because you are God. You are our God and there is no other. In spite of the difficulties of life, Lord, you're always there for us. And as we come here today, Lord, I pray that you speak to the hearts of every single person those who are guests, who are here for the very first time, those who are here many times, Lord, may your word come alive in our lives. May we hear it and not only hear it, but apply it in our lives. Transform us from the inside out, Lord, as we commit this time to you in Jesus' most precious, loving name, amen, amen. Let me ask you a question, because you know when I speak, I love it to be interactive. I love to be discussing with you out loud. So here's the question, and just tell me your answers out loud, okay? Okay. What are some of the things we will always have to deal with in life? What are some of the things we always have to deal with in life? For example, gravity. What are the other things? Give me. Traffic, yes. Okay, what else? <laughs> Problems, yes. What else? Change, yes. Pollution, yes. Weather, okay. Sige pa, sige pa. Bills, yes, that's for sure. I'm with you there. So get back. Hunger, yes, hunger, thirst. What else? What else? Love, yeah. What's that? Decisions, yes. Taxes, politics, right? All these things and so much more. Death as well. There's one thing you didn't mention, and that is conflict. Would you agree that we all have to deal with conflict in our lives? All of us have to deal with conflict. It's inevitable. It's happening. If it's not happening to your life right now, stop a moment and think, what conflict am I going through life today, right now? What is the conflict that you're facing? It's not just you, friends, because it's almost everyone. In the world today, you've got wars, Russia, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, Ateneo, no, never mind. <laughs> you've, got, uh, you've got workplace conflicts. You know, the survey came out, 85% of people today are experiencing conflict at work, 85%. Maybe that's you as well. You've got marriage conflicts. During the pandemic, they said that physical abuse and verbal abuse to wives and children doubled. Kawawa. But that's what's happening in, in marriages and families. You've got church conflict. Is there conflict in church? You know what they say, when two or three are gathered together, there is conflict. <laughs> there is conflict all over the place. One thing is that you should never run away from conflict. But that's what we like to do. We don't like to face conflict. We like to deny it. We like to avoid it. We like to run away from it, hide from it, turn our backs from it. That's what we want to do. But friends, if we don't settle conflicts, it will grow in our hearts. It'll cause bitterness and so much more. I'll explain that in a while. We need to face our conflicts. I'm so glad that you're here today because today's message from our passage is so practical for everyday life. I love how the Bible, how God speaks to our hearts in narratives and allows us to see life lessons that we can all learn. Today, our topic is victory over conflict. Can you all say that? Victory over conflict. And my prayer, and I know it's God's prayer, is that all of us, every single one of us here, will learn how to handle conflict, will learn how to resolve conflict, will learn how to reconcile and put things to rest. Would you agree that relationships are a blessing? Yes, but relationships can also be complicated, especially when people's hearts and minds are hard and not willing to, to listen to each other. So friends, as you listen today, I pray that you take notes 
or take screenshots, whatever, so that you can look at this later on and, and discuss it with your family and discuss it with your friends and your D groups that all the conflicts of your lives would be settled. And I pray that this message would really speak to your hearts. Well, we start out with the book of Joshua, chapter 22, verse 1 and 2. Let's all read it together. Then Joshua summoned the Rebunites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that, the Mo that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you and have listened to my voice in all that I commanded you. Joshua, the leader, he summoned, he called two groups, the Reubenites and the Gadites. Now, you have to understand, how many tribes were there in Israel? Twelve, very good. Twelve tribes. God said to these twelve tribes of Israel, from slavery, I'm going to bring you to the promised land. And now Joshua has already entered into the promised land. Okay? They're there. And when they're there, what Joshua did is he divided the promised land into different territories. One for each tribe. So all the tribes were represented in the promised land. But there's something that happened, okay? And I'll tell you, the, I'll give you a little history. It starts out with the area that is west of the Jordan River. This is Canaan prior to Joshua conquering it. You have the Hittites, the Hivites, the Gergesens, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Damiites, right? They're all there. This is west of the Jordan. This is the promised land. This is where Israel is today, all right? And what happened? Back in Numbers, before they invaded and conquered, before they even were at, at this point invading the promised land, it says here, now the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad had exceedingly large number of livestock. They have a lot of sheep, goat, camels, etc. So when they saw the land of Jazer and Gilead, okay, which is east of the Jordan River, that it was indeed a place suitable for livestock. So the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben came and spoke to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the leaders of the congregation. They saw the land was beautiful. It's perfect for them. East of the Jordan, okay? What did they say? They said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants. And as a possession, do not take us across the Jordan. So they wanted to stay in this, in this side, east of the Jordan. But Moses, who was a leader at that time, not yet Joshua, but Moses said to the sons of Gad and to the sons of Reuben, shall your brothers go to war while you yourselves sit here? Remember, they haven't conquered the promised land yet. So Moses, are you going to let your brothers fight the war all by themselves? Ano ba kayo? That's a suerte, di ba? So it says here, now, why are you discouraging the sons of Israel from the crossing over to the land which the Lord has given them? Why are you choosing to stay behind? So this is it. Moses said to them, if you will do this, if you will arm yourselves before the Lord for the war, and all of you armed men cross over, cross over where? The Jordan before the Lord until he has driven his enemies out from before him. And the land is subdued, conquered before the Lord. Then afterward you shall return and be free of obligation towards the Lord and toward Israel. And this land shall be yours for a possession before the Lord. Is that clear? Moses says, if you want to get the land, go ahead. We'll give you the land, but the condition is you help us fight the war. Help us fight the war. So what did they do? Well, the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben spoke to Moses saying, your servants will do just as my Lord commands. They agreed. They said, we will fight that war with you. We will not come back to this place until it's all done. That's what, the, that's what they agreed. Now we fast forward to where we are today in Joshua. Joshua 2, 3. Remember, Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites, and he says, you have not forsaken your brothers these many days to this day. 
but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. Joshua was commending them, was saying, you guys, I really appreciate what you've done. You did a great job. It says here, and now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he spoke to them. Therefore, turn now and go to your tents, to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan. You have to understand that this, when he talks about these days, this is seven years. They fought against all those different kingdoms for about seven years. That's how much they sacrificed their lives. It's not easy. They left their families. They left their children, their cattle, livestock in the east side and went over to the west fighting these wars. They were like OFW soldiers, willing to risk their lives, willing to risk everything in order to uphold the promise that they gave Moses and they gave the Lord. Us today, when you make a commitment, when you make a promise, do you see it through to the very end? Do you willingly sacrifice whatever you need to do in order to fulfill that commitment? Well, that's what the Reubenites and the Gadites did. And so now they're being rewarded. They're saying, go ahead, you can now go back and take that land, the land that has been promised to you. So notice this. These are all the, the properties, the land of the enemy before Joshua conquered it. And then watch as it morphs into what happens, the division from the, the Jordan River. All of a sudden you have the 12 tribes divided into the promised land. And then you have Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben here on this side. Now, when they say two and a half tribes, what are they talking about, two and a half tribes? You see, Manasseh was so, so huge that they divided into two so you have nine and a half here, and you have two and a half here, making a total of 12. But notice, these three tribes were on the east side of the Jordan River. Take note of that, because that's important later on. Here, Joshua 22, verse 5 and 6, he now tells them, he says, Only be very careful to what? Observe. Be very careful to observe the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God and walk in all his ways and keep his commandments and hold fast to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went to their tents. Joshua I'm sure it was sad to see them go. But before sending them away, he says to them, I want you to remember this. Always, even if we're not together, even if we won't see each other as much as we're seeing each other now, I want you, as you go your way, to always put God first. Put his law, his command first. And it's a charge to us as well. We must always walk with the Lord, hold fast his commandments, love others, and love God with all our soul and our strength and our might. We should always put God first. In our lives. So Joshua, it says here, bless them. He may have prayed over them and says, May you go in peace. And they went to their side, to this area here. Question Did Joshua and the two and a half tribes separate peacefully? Yes or no? Yes, they did. They had a great uh, parting of ways. Now, parting in no sense of there's no hard feelings, it's just that we're physically separated from you. Was this God's will? You know, God actually wanted his whole chosen race, Israel, to be on the promised land. He wanted all of them here. But Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben chose to stay on the east side. They made that request. Moses granted it. It may not have been God's perfect will, but it was allowed. Today, oftentimes, we know God's perfect will, but we choose to do things our way. Not sin, but still not exactly what God wants. And in doing that, we get our way. We end up doing the things we want to do without sinning, 
But you know what? We're settling for second best. And when we ever settle for second best, just be ready for consequences to happen. And we'll see that in a few minutes. The consequence comes in. Joshua 22 verse 10 says, When they, these are the eastern tribes, the three tribes, came to the region of the Jordan, which is in the land of Canaan, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh, what did they do? Built an altar there by the Jordan, a large altar in appearance. Now, they arrive at their, at their place, okay? And they're thinking, you know what? We miss our brothers from the west side. And we really want to remember God. We don't want to forget all that God has done in our lives. We belong to the nation of Israel. And so in order to remember him, why don't we build an altar? A similar altar to the one that was set up by, by the people in Shiloh. And so let me show you what, what it's like. Here is Shiloh. And at this particular place, they built the tabernacle. I hope you're familiar with the tabernacle, the place where God rested. The Holy of Holies is here. They sacrificed animals. This was handled by the Levite priests. It was a sacred place. And it was actually declared by God to build it here. But what did the eastern tribes do? They said, you know what? Let's build one for ourselves close to us. Because we won't have a chance to go to the other side of the Jordan to visit that temple, the tabernacle. It goes on in verse 20, 11. And the sons of Israel, the guys from the western side, what happened? They heard it. They heard it. They heard about it and said, Behold, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region of the Jordan on the side belonging to the sons of Israel. So, friends, here you have what they call hearsay. They heard it said, Oh, those guys are building a temple, and this is very dangerous. Hearsay is so dangerous. Could what you hear be fake news? Yes. Could what you hear be exaggerated news? Could what you hear be gossip? Yes. All of these things. When we have sometimes thoughts, of what other people are doing without checking, without verifying the facts. We start to think. We start to have assumptions. We start to even maybe make accusations. What's going on? What are they doing? Why aren't they doing? You know what end up we end up doing? We judge motives. We're judging motives. What is that eastern tribe doing over there? They can't do that. You see, they heard that this altar was built, and they know that because of the, the book of Deuteronomy, there was what they call the, the law of central worship, which is where there's only one place, one God, and one form of worship, one altar of worship. There's nothing else. No one can build another altar, just that one altar. So when the sons of Israel heard of it, the whole congregation of the sons of Israel gathered themselves at Silo. Continue to go up against them in war. Can you imagine? Guys, pull out your swords. We're going to go against our brothers, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the, and the Manasseh tribe. That's how crazy it was. A moment of misunderstanding can lead to a lifetime of despair, broken relationships. Friendships can, can end in a few minutes. They were thinking in their minds, you know, our brothers are falling into idolatry. Let's stop it. It can't be done. This should not be done. How do you feel when you're misunderstood? It's painful, no? When people judge you, when people say things against you, and there's no way you can defend yourself, it is so painful. It hurts deep inside. And that's when people choose to think ill. They, they judge your motives. They choose to decide what, is it, what your actions are all about without even asking. You see, friends, assumptions lead to accusations. The emotion of the hearts of the Israelites 
on the west side were so charged because they knew that if, if our brothers in the east are sinning, God may put a, a punishment on all of us. And that's the way it works. Remember Ai, when Achan stole part of the spoils? When he stole, the whole tribe would have been, would have been, um, they would have been affected. So they had to take care of Achan right away and his family. And just like our families, when one member of our family is in sin, we all suffer. When people in your workplace are doing the wrong thing, everyone suffers. It's the principle of, of one for all. Misunderstandings has the power to turn friendships into enemies, friends into enemies in a matter of moments, in a matter of moments. So what's the lesson for us? The lesson is don't react, interact. Can you all say that? Don't react, interact. In other words, ask first before accusing. Ask first before attacking. It's a very simple rule, and you've heard this often, but how often do we apply it? We're all guilty of, of listening and not applying this rule. Coming up with our own thoughts. Be willing to put whatever you hear about you or others, whatever that issue is, be willing to put it in a suspension file and not think ill of the person yet until you spend time to find a way to get to them directly, to sit down with them personally and talk it out. Our common action is when we hear someone say something against us, we look for other people. We tell them, you know what? That person said this against me. And vice versa. When we see someone doing something wrong, we don't tell them right away. We go to other people and, and, and share them, with them this, this insight, this, this thing that we've seen. And that causes poison. It causes poison. Don't tell others about what you have seen and you say, well, I'm telling you because I want, to, I want you to pray about it. No, 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 that's, that's wrong. Don't pray about it. First, go to that person. Ask that person why they're doing what they're doing. Clear it up. Understand their motives and listen, listen, listen. Are you with me? See, what happens is there's three things we can do. We can run away from conflict. When you run away from conflict, the issue is never discussed and might arise again, possibility for bitterness be harbored. That's what could happen if you run away from conflict. So realize there's growth from conflict. And when you restore friendships, when you, when you reconcile from a conflict, you know, you, there's always a stronger bond. So prepare for conflict and always handle it in a Christ-like way. There's some people who... What they like to do is they write, they running to face conflict. They want to go ahead and face conflict. So what do they do? If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at what? Peace. Be at peace with all men. Be at peace with all men. You see, friends, God's heart is unity. Can you all say unity? That's God's heart. He wants all of us to be united. 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 1, verse Chapter 1, verse 10 says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. It's God's desire that we all be one. Because there's so many divisions in so many factions all over the place. When people come to me and they say, you know, I want to tell you about this situation that we're faced with, I say, wait, wait, wait. Have you talked to that person already? If you haven't talked to them, don't talk to me, please. They say, no, no, I want to just tell you this. Wait, wait. Have you talked to them? Because that's the key, talking to them directly. And then you ask them, why are you telling me this? Keo, if people come to you with, with these juicy news, you know, do you listen to it or do you say, why are you telling me this? And then you also ask them, can I quote you on this? And that might stop it all together. Friends, refuse to listen until that person has dealt with it personally. There's no reason for you to hear about it. What can you do? Unless you're, you're going to come in as a mediator, okay. But if not, then ask them to follow the ways of the Lord. Why? Because James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20 says, This you know, everyone, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be 
quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of the man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Friends, we need to apply this in our life. Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Look at your life today. Are you applying this? Or do you go straight to anger? Without listening, without talking. Many people do that. In, in relationships, oftentimes the wife and husband are talking, and, and when she brings up something, a, an important matter for the family, the husband has no patience for it, and he just blows up. He starts yelling and screaming and saying, you don't understand, etc., etc. This can't be. There was this one couple who were, you know, a model couple, and the husband was so impressed with his wife because she hardly fought him in arguments. He asked her one day, honey, tell me, why is it that when I shout, when I get angry, you're so calm, you're so peaceful, you don't retaliate. What do you do? She says, oh, when times like that happen, I just, I clean the toilet. What? You mean clean the toilet prevents you from getting angry? How is that? She says, oh, I, I use your toothbrush. I <laughs> know. Listening saves lives. Listening saves Wives, don't do that, huh? <laughs> Listening saves lives. Let me tell you, early in our marriage with Cindy, like many, many couples, we had a big argument. And our argument was about finances, believe it or not. It was such that we didn't have a system. We didn't agree on certain things. So there was mistrust, distrust, whatever. So we started talking about finances, and our talk got louder and louder and louder. And we were now looking at each other as if we were mortal enemies. And then I stopped all of us. I said, stop, 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 stop. I said, wait, wait. Why are we fighting? I said, you're not my enemy. And she looked at me and says, yeah, you're not my enemy. And I said, let's pray, let's pray. So you know what? We actually stopped and we prayed. And after praying, we said, okay, let's resume. And so we now resumed in a different spirit, in a different heart, with a different motive. Friends, you need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Now, what causes conflict? I want to hear from you. What causes conflict? Miscommunication? Misunderstanding? Assumptions, yes? Pride, very good. Anapa? Selfishness, yes. All of that. Friends, you're right. Miscommunication. A human personal agenda. I, have to, I want to do things my way. I don't care about your way. How about this? Preferences. I prefer it to be done this way, you know? And then, you know, pride and selfishness. Wrong assumption. Those, these are what cause conflict. Question, what's the result of mishandling conflict? When you mishandle conflict, what's the result? Tell me. Broken relationships, absolutely. Anapa, it hurts, yes. What else? Bitterness, absolutely, yes. Stress. Friends, loss of joy. Don't you have a loss of joy when you don't have to handle a conflict properly? Hurt, division. You and division, you get divided in your heart. Broken relationships and stress. Well, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 5 says this. 1 and 2 says, do not what? Do not judge. Friends, stop right there. Do not judge. The Bible tells us don't judge. Why? Because we don't know people's hearts. We don't know people's intentions. We don't know their motives. We're not God. It says, so that you will not be judged. Likewise, for in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. So Jesus is saying, do not judge. Let me tell you what happens with many people today. There was a lady who celebrated her birthday. She invited her family and friends to her home, and they had a grand celebration. She posted a picture in Facebook. Do you do that? Yes. And so she put a poster, a, a post, and she said, thanks to all my family and friends. We enjoyed the food, gifts especially. And, you know, she didn't have a big house, so she could only invite so many people. But she planned, I'm going to invite my other friends tomorrow and continue their celebration. But guess what? When those friends who were not invited in this party, saw the post, 
How did they feel? Jealous, envious, angry. Why wasn't I invited? I, you know, I'm the friend. I should have been there. And so, you know what? They didn't realize that tomorrow they have a party to go to as well. They put all these assumptions to the point where, you know what their action was? Their action was unfriend. <laughs> Simple, unfriend. They didn't even talk to that friend who had the party. Do you do this? Don't. Okay, never mind. <laughs> if you have ever unfriended a person, that is a conflict that existed. And maybe you have to go back and fix it. That's the easiest thing to do, unfriend. But you know what, friends? That's, that's the wrong thing to do. There was a person in, in ministry, and uh, he was of a different preference of uh, a candidate during the presidential election. He decided to put his, his views on the internet. And he was ranting and raving about the other candidates, you know, putting them down. And it was a lot of, a lot of uh, just voicing out his, his sentiments, but in a way that was not very right. I had to call his attention because he's one of the leaders. And I said, I hope you don't mind. Let's, let's sit down. Let's have coffee. He agreed, and so we did. And I said, can you just share your heart? I want to hear what's going on in your life. And he did. He opened up, and he shared what's happening. And, and I asked him, well, why are you posting all these things in, in the Internet? And he did as well. And after we talked and talked and I heard him out, I said, would you consider, um, consider not doing this anymore? You know, holding back on your personal comments because it reflects on your person and it reflects on your relationship with Christ. You know what? I'm so glad that he says, yeah, okay, I'll do that. In other words, he saw the, the whole big picture and he was willing to, to change. Today, maybe some of you are in group chats. Are you in group, Viber group chats, WhatsApp group chats, all these chats? Yes? Yes. And what happens if all of a sudden you find out that no one's chatting in your group anymore? Where did they all go? And then you realize, because someone from a new chat group that was formed without you, <laughs> sakit, no? Ang sakit, ay nako. They pala all went to another chat group and they're all there talking about you. <laughs> that doesn't happen, no? That doesn't happen. You know, when you feel like you're an outcast, you need to go and talk to the leader of that group and ask them, what was the issue? Is there something I did wrong? I, I need to know because I, I want to fix whatever we have differences, whatever different. Let's fix it up. You see, oftentimes we have judgmental thoughts. Judgmental thoughts where we say, the person purposely did that to hurt me. We have judgmental thoughts. My spouse doesn't love me. I think he, she is jealous of me. I'm sure he, she just wants to take all the credit for my work. I know they, they're, they're set on destroying me. These are judgmental thoughts and more. What goes through your mind when you first initially see or hear whatever is happening outside around you? Ecclesiastes tells us this. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry. Don't be eager to get, get angry right away. Why? For anger resides in the bosom of fools. You might find out later that, wow, you, you are wrong for judging them, assuming, etc. Well, coffee, yes. <laughs> Have coffee with people and spend time in prayer. If you want to talk to them about an issue, Spend time with them and, and talk to them about that issue. And by God's grace, you'll work things out. You see, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, Judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. By judging others, we bind, blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace to which others are just as entitled to as we are. We have blind spots. Remember that. We can't see everything. So make sure you go to God. Warren Worsby says, yes, let God be the judge. Yes, he is the judge. Your job, my job today is to be a witness, to be a witness. Back to Joshua 22. It says there in verse 13 and 14. Then the sons of Israel sent to the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and to the half tribe of Manasseh into the land of Gilead. They sent Phinehas, the son of Eleazar. He's the chief priest at that time. And with him, ten chiefs, one chief for each father's household from each of the tribes of Israel. So one representative from each tribe plus Phineas. 
And each one of them was the head of his father's household among the thousands of Israel. They sent an emissary, a delegation, a fact-finding committee. And this is what's very good. They didn't go to war immediately. They chose to, let's find out what's happening. And I encourage you, when you're going to sit down and confront a person about a certain issue that's very sensitive in your life, bring along someone, a neutral party, a person who's just there to listen, just to observe, just to watch. And if ever something comes up in the future about he said, she said, what they said, that person can verify and, and testify, no, I was there, and this is what was said. So think about doing that, especially when it's, it's major issues. Always bring a, a third party along to witness the event. Now, what does Jesus tell us when it comes to biblical conflicts? How to solve any biblical conflict, especially when it involves sin? Matthew 18, 15 to 17. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. Go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. Step number one, go to them directly in private. You and them. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. That's step number two. Step number three, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So, in other words, do everything you can. Follow the process to restore, to reconcile, to unite hearts once again. Do the best you can. There might come a time that you have to really tell it to the church. But hopefully, because hearts are molded and right with God, that doesn't happen. That should not happen. So, back to Joshua, verse 15, 16. They came to the sons of Reuben, the investigating party, and to the sons of Gad and Manasseh, and spoke with them, saying, Now this is how not to, how not to approach the, part, the party that you are, you're looking at, okay? Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What is this unfaithful act which you have committed against the God of Israel? Turning away from following the Lord this day, and building yourselves, what? an altar to rebel against the Lord this day. You see what happened? They went not to gather facts, but to throw accusations. And that's something we shouldn't do. That's something we shouldn't do. Lesson number two, focus on the issue and a resolution. Focus on an issue. What's the issue here and the resolution? So don't follow what, the, what Phineas and the, and the group did. When we come to issues... Focus on the issue and avoid. Avoid exaggerating. When you meet the person, don't ever say, you never or you always. Husbands and wives, this oftentimes happens. You should say instead, you know, I feel, I feel that what you said did this to me. Labeling, derogatory name calling. Avoid that. Avoid playing historian, bringing up the past, failures, mistakes, and broken promises. When it's over and done with, do not bring it up again. And loaded questions, statements like, can't you do anything right? So avoid these things. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 says, Brethren, talking to Christians, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, in other words, you see someone in a sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. I think we should remember that. Not righteousness, righteous acts of, of your, you know, I'm better than you. I'm going to tell you what to do. No, but in gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. It's right for you not to just ignore sins that you see. If that person is close to you, if you care about that person, it's, it's your obligation to just point it out to them. Not because you are better than them, but in your imperfection, you tell them, I see this happening in your life, and maybe you, you need to do something about it. If you truly love them and care for them, you will do this. Ephesians 4 tells us in verse 29, how do we do this? It says, 
Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is what? Good for edification, to build up according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. In Joshua 22, verse 21, it says, Then the people of Reuben, Gad, answered the heads of the clans of Israel. If you were part of these eastern tribes, how would you answer them? They throw all these accusations against you. How would you respond? Would you say, oh, I give up, I give up? Huh? Or would you retaliate? There are many possible responses. But look at this, look at this, possible reactions. Why are you judging us with rebellion and unfaithfulness? You're already accusing us without getting the facts first. How dare you? Do, who do you think you are? They could have responded this way. And this is where you and I need to be careful in how we respond if someone was to come to us and say, there's something I need to share with you. There's something I've observed. How do we respond? We should respond with humility. Look how the, the Reubenites responded. The mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God, the Lord, he knows and may Israel itself know if it was in rebellion or if an unfaithful act against the Lord do not save us this day. This phrase here, the mighty one, God, the Lord, is El Elohim Yahweh. This was in, indicting, Lord, come, be witness to this event. You be the judge. If we are wrong, then do not save us this day. They were calling upon God's name. They continued, if we have built an altar for ourselves to turn away from the Lord or to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings, may the Lord himself punish us. They were so humble and so willing to say, whatever we have done wrong, we're willing to take the consequence. It goes on in verse 25. The truth is, we have built this altar because we fear that in the future, your descendants will say to ours, the West says to the East, what right do you have to worship the Lord, the God of Israel? Because being in the West, they say, you in the East have no part from us. You're across the Jordan River. The Lord has placed the Jordan River as a barrier between your people and, your, and you people. Of Reuben and Gad, you have no claim to the Lord. So your descendants may prevent our descendants from worshiping the Lord. You see, the motive in the hearts of the eastern tribe was to continue to be one, united with the western tribe. They wanted to be one. They wanted to still be able to worship the same God. They're also pointing out the fact that the Lord has placed the Jordan River as a barrier between you, our people and you people, which is really technically not true because the eastern tribe chose to live across the Jordan River. God did not put a barrier. They chose to allow that barrier to exist between them. So not following God's perfect will is now causing them to pay the consequence. It goes on. So we decided to build the altar not for burnt offerings or sacrifices, but as a memorial. Yumpala, that's what it's for. It will remind our descendants and your descendants that we, too, have the right to worship the Lord at His sanctuary with our burnt offerings, sacrifices, and peace offerings. Then your descendants will not be able to say to ours, you have no claim to the Lord. You hear their hearts. This was not in any way to rob the Western tribes from the, the honor and privilege of having an altar, that we have one also. No, it was just a memorial. Just a, it was, for example, a way to remember the Lord God. Not to burn offerings, not to burn sacrifices, but just as a spiritual identity that they also belong to the Lord. Verse 20 says, If they say this, our descendants can re reply, Look at this copy of the Lord's altar that our ancestors made. It is not for burnt offerings or sacrifices. It is a reminder of the relationship both of us have with the Lord. That's what they passed on to the Western tribes. In other words, they're saying, this isn't a replica to use. It is a replica to remind us of our unity. That's what it's all about. Verse 29, far be it from us to rebel against the Lord or turn away from Him by building our own altar for burnt offerings, grain offerings, or sacrifices, 
Only the altar of the Lord our God that stands in front of the tabernacle may be used for that purpose. They acknowledged the law of central worship, one God, one place, and one altar. They were not trying to do anything wrong. And now they've been able to expose their hearts, their motive, explain everything that was going on and reason why they did this. Lesson number three, respond humbly and honor God. Can you all say that? Respond humbly and honor God. You see, gracious communication is a key to resolving misunderstanding. The two and a half tribes were willing to share their hearts with the Western tribe, and they did it in humility. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, A gentle answer, what? Turns away wrath, but a harsh word steers up anger. Make sure your words are always gentle. Proverbs, 15, Proverbs 13 verse 10 through insolence comes nothing but strife. Insolence meaning pride and anger, arrogance. But wisdom is with those who receive counsel. When you're being corrected, someone comes to you to correct you. What should you do? Ask gently. Aim to listen and accept the explanation. When you're correcting someone... Ask them gently, aim to listen to them, and accept their explanation. Now, on the other side, when being corrected, and it's not your fault, someone's coming to you to correct you, avoid reacting. Answer humbly and affirm the person. Thank the person for, correct, for coming to you, even if it's not your fault. But now, the reverse, when you're being corrected and you know it's your fault, Something that you did wrong, avoid reacting. Admit your fault and ask for an apology. I hope this is something that we can all apply in our lives and we can learn from because every day you and I are faced with potential conflicts. If not, you're going through one today. Is this helping you so far? Let's look at what First Peter says. All of you, all of us, clothe yourselves with what? Humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You and I really ought to be focused on what, what does God want, not what do I want. What does God want? And God wants love. He wants unity. He wants harmony among all of us. Now, here's some tips. Choose your battles. Don't fight every battle that comes before you. Choose your battles. If you're willing to let things go, let things go. Now, you don't need to win every conflict. Husbands and wives, you know, there's so many conflicts oftentimes you're faced with. Don't make those small conflicts escalate to a world war in your family. You know? And husbands, you don't have to win everything. Even, even if you win the battle, you'll end up losing the war. So be very careful. Your real enemy, the devil, wants to divide. Go for a win-win, not for a win-lose, okay? And accept what can't be resolved right now. There might be issues that can't be resolved right now. Okay, we'll, we'll work on it another time. We'll work on it another time, but we'll keep on working to resolve things as best as we can. At this stage, I'd like to call a couple who's going to share their personal lives with us and how they faced situations in their, in their marriage and their families and settle these conflicts. Please welcome Vikoy and Jing Risma. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I grew up in a family where my mother was the dominant figure in our house. Being, and being very religious, she spent most of her time at church and teaching catechism while my dad worked hard and away from home. 
my mom would tell us that dad was not a good provider and hearing that a lot of times made me dislike my mother more and made me hate saying goodbyes to my dad. By God's grace, I became the first Christian in my family through a campus ministry. This enabled me to focus on my goal to leave home and be fully independent by graduating early at the age of 19 and working by the age of 20 to 21. I became a college instructor and did volunteer work in a graduate team ministry. I accomplished everything as planned. I grew up with a mindset that a perfect family was one that had to be seen as okay and without problems. My parents made me feel that average was acceptable and there was no need to excel. We were well cared for, but I somehow felt my, that my parents were emotionally distant and disinterested in me. Coming from a traditional Protestant family, I grew up in Sunday school and would accept Jesus Christ and be discipled during my high school years. In college, I became part of an inter-school Christian organization where I, met, where I met a girl who was independent, sociable, and very outgoing. In contrast, I was generally reserved and avoided calling attention to myself. She encouraged and helped me discover the value of excellence in everything I did. This made me notice the gap in how my parents encouraged me and how she encouraged me. I soon became emotionally dependent on her, a dependence that led to the sin of premarital sex. Our hidden sin would soon result in her getting pregnant and our getting married soon after my college graduation. <clears throat> After making our confession and seeking forgiveness from God, our parents and our church for what we had done, despite being youth leaders, I thought everything would be fine and perfect. This felt especially true after my parents and siblings would eventually become believers. But as the years went by, no matter how much I strived to be a good wife and a good mother to my children, I always felt I was not good enough. I thought that marriage and raising a family would be as normal and okay as it had been in my own family. But as a young couple in our early 20s, unexpected challenges came our way. I was also angry with myself when my first child was born with a partial disability that I attributed to my sin with Jing. I tried hard to make things okay by focusing on work, but everything was merely a facade. There was anger kept in my heart that was growing. At that time, I was always busy with work and kept what I felt to myself. When we had our third child, my wife had to give up her career. We, saw, we soon fought over our finances. This made me resent my wife because from a lack of proper communication, I mistakenly felt she was blaming me for not bringing home enough income. I responded by blaming her for not contributing any money. I would verbally abuse her and at one time actually hurt her out of a fit of rage. To better provide for my family, I accepted an overseas assignment. While, while I was away, my children would have problems that challenged my perception of a perfect family. After my overseas assignment, we now had to take care of my mother-in-law who had begun struggling with dementia. Though I knew God, I, had, I hadn't fully surrendered myself and relied on my own strength and capabilities. When Jing challenged my decisions or ignored my advice, it made me angry. Our shouting matches would happen often and in front of our children. When my husband got back from an overseas assignment, we were blessed with the comforts of life, but it seemed like we were missing out on something. Our children became cold and distant preferring to stay inside their rooms or be with friends rather than be with us. My husband and I had our fights. We kept refreshing old wounds and inflicting more emotional pain on each other. I start blaming myself for not doing my part well. Thankfully, God led us to CCF Alabang in 2017. By that time, despite the good family image I tried to project, our lives were actually unmanageable with regular blaming and denying. We would eventually get connected to a couple's D group where we'd share some of our difficulties, but never the ugly truth about our family. We heard about the Glorious Hope program and considered joining in order to help one of our kids who was struggling, struggling with depression. With such a burden in my heart, 
The Lord used someone from the Glorious Hope program here at CCF Alabang to tell me that I had a problem and I needed a genuine encounter with God. I realized that I was powerless and no matter how much I tried to look fine and okay, I was denying the fact that I was not. My life has become unmanageable. The unresolved family conflicts and dysfunction in my childhood affected my own family. I also found out that I had distorted view of God. And I understood why I had doubts, worries, and fears, and why I didn't like goodbyes. The past verbal and emotional abuse from my mother and the limited interaction with my loving father created a void in my heart that pushed me to cope by finding happiness outside our house. Because of for me, it was home only when my dad was there. I had trust issues with fellow women, not realizing it started from my disappointment, anger, bitterness, and distrust towards my mom. I realized that these mechanisms were there to help me cope with pain, fear, and loneliness, but they slowly turned me into the person I never wanted to be, and that was my mother. The Lord made me realize that I was living a lie and that my denial was keeping me from truly experiencing God's love. I was not admitting that I had an anger problem. I realized that I had a distorted view of God as being distant and disinterested, which kept me from calling on Him and made me rely on my own capabilities. I've come to realize that my being, my, my being angry was my way of controlling situations around me and was keeping me from communicating properly with people that I love. Jesus initiated the healing, but I needed to accept the truth that I am powerless without Him and that I needed to obey in order to, for the healing and restoration to begin. I also needed to make amends with my wife, Jing, and our kids as they were the ones I was hurting. I'm still a work in progress, but I must learn to accept Christ's perfect plan for me and not my personal view of what's okay and what's not. And I must trust that He will provide help when I get weary and things become difficult as He promised in Matthew 11, 28-30, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. By God's grace, I have finally become aware that I have been verbally and emotionally hurting my husband and children. I disrespected my husband whenever I would dump my disappointments over him on our children. I've forgiven myself and asked forgiveness from my mother, my husband, Vicoy, and our children. By God's grace, my mind is being renewed as I hold on to his promises and instructions on how to live according to God's perfect design. I am experiencing transformation as, as, as I let go of my old self and letting God take full control of my life. With this verse, I declare God's victory in my life. In Galatians 2.20, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am Vicoy Risma, a renewed follower of Christ. I was once angry over my disappointments in life, but now I trust God's victorious plan for me and my family for his glory and praise. I am Jing Risma, a follower of Christ who was once bitter, but now getting better. Once disheartened, now made victorious by God's presence in my life. All glory and honor to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Let's give God a big hand, huh? Stay here. Let's join our hearts and pray for this couple. Would you join me? Just raise your hand and symbolically pray for them with me. Father in heaven, thank you for Vikoy and Jing. Thank you, Lord, that at the foot of the cross, 
all things work out, that your sovereign love and grace, forgiveness washes over them, and they realize, Lord, that they can do nothing apart from you. I pray that their testimony would be an inspiration to all of us here, Father, that we would surrender and completely give our lives to you, knowing that you are the God of of harmony. You're the God who wants people to be united and at peace. Thank you, Father, for this couple. Protect them. Take care of their, their hearts and their family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. So after the Eastern tribe tells the Western tribe their reasons, when Phineas, the priest and the leaders of the congregation, even the heads of the families of Israel who were with him, heard the words which the sons of Reuben spoke, it pleased them. It pleased them. Sometimes you have to come to a point where you have to learn to forgive. And forgiveness is one of the hardest things in conflict resolution. But what does the Bible say? 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Bears all things believes all things and hopes all things, endures all things. Here is where Phineas and the group believed them. They, did, they gave them the benefit of the doubt. They chose to, to trust them at this stage. In Joshua 22, verse 31, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, they said, Today we know that the Lord is in our midst because you have not committed this unfaithful act against the Lord. Now you have delivered the sons of Israel from the, la- from the hand of God. Can you imagine what could have turned out to be a terrible, catastrophic war turned out to be peaceful? There was a unity of hearts. There was a sense of forgiveness. In Colossians 3, 12 and 13 says, So, as to those who have been chosen of God, if you have been chosen by God, you are holy, beloved, Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so you should, so also should you. You see, God has forgiven us, and we should forgive others. When you forgive, remember, as God forgave you, you in your heart, say, I will not dwell on this incident. I will not bring up this incident and use it against you. I will not talk to others about this incident. I will not hold this incident between us. This is putting closure to reconciliation. This is once and for all saying, it is over and done with. I'm willing to move on. I want to unite hearts and be one. This is all about grace, trusting God to take care of whatever damage has happened. There are instances when you are misunderstood and you cannot defend yourself. And times like that, you need to trust God. God, I entrust these individuals to you. There's nothing I can do, but you are the God who who is the righteous judge. You will uphold the truth, even if I cannot defend myself. There are times that you just allow God to take care of the damage control for you. In Joshua 30, 33 and 34, it says, The word pleased the sons of Israel, and the sons of Israel blessed God, and they did not speak of going up against them in war to destroy the land in which the sons of Reuben called the... Okay. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad called the altar witness. For they said, It is a witness between us. That the Lord is God. And this is the, the ending of this story. And with this, we see how this delegation came to the point where they accepted the, the, the answer of the Eastern tribes, and there was peace. There was peace. The result of the conflict, a source of conflict, becomes a source of glory. And your lives can be stronger together as you move on. Victory over conflict. Remember, friends, be careful. Be careful of of accusing others, of jumping to conclusions, of making misjudgments, of thinking the worst of others. Hold back and be careful to communicate very clearly 
The eastern tribe, before they even built the altar, should have gone to the western tribe and says, you know what, we're thinking of building this altar as a remembrance, as a memorial. Is that okay with you? That could have ended everything from the very beginning. Remember, don't react, interact. Focus on the issue and a resolution. Respond humbly and honor God. And you'll see that a source of conflict can become a source of glory. I don't know if you're familiar, but in October 1962, there was the Cuban Missile Crisis between the U.S. and Russia. It was in dispute for Cuba. Russia was sending missiles to Cuba, and it was threatening the U.S. The U.S. wanted to respond by, by taking action in war against Russia. But somehow, there was a meeting of minds. John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev agreed, let's not go to war. They settled the differences by talking, communicating, taking care of all misunderstandings. And they said to prevent a future catastrophic nuclear war from happening, because that's what almost happened, a nuclear war. From that ever happening in the future, let's have a device between us. Let's have a hotline, and they put together a hotline where they can directly communicate with each other. It's a hotline that they call the red phone, the red phone. It's not in use today, of course. They've got other more high-tech ways of, of communicating, but it comes to mind to me, do you today have a hotline with God? Do you have a way of communicating with Him? Because his line is open to you only, 24-7. He wants to, to communicate with you all the time. If whatever problems you have, go to him. I like the fact that it's called a red phone. And red symbolizes the blood. Jesus' sacrifice that opened the door for us to enter into God's presence. To have this communication with him as a, a son to a father. I pray that your life today would have an open hotline with God, a red phone through Jesus Christ. And I'll pray just before we close for any of you here who want to have that line of communication with God established, a, rela a relationship of, of you being a sinner and Him being the Savior. But think about this, friends. What would it look like if we all learned to love and forgive one another? What would it look like? What kind of world would we live in? Let me close with a poem entitled, In Pursuit of Peace. In Pursuit of Peace. Conflicts happen when there is misunderstanding. Peace settles within when truth is left standing. Conflicts ensue when there is misjudgment. Hearts are established when facts are present. Conflicts abound as miscommunication disconnects. Joy bursts forth as each one projects with respect. Conflicts thrive when pride shows its ugly side. Humility enters with power setting arrogance aside. Conflicts transpire when selfishness is unmoved, relationships are restored when self is removed. Conflicts occur when personal agendas are pushed. Divisions are destroyed as motives are ambushed. Conflicts appear as monuments that will not fall. Our God brings forgiveness for peace amongst all. Let's join our hearts in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you know the hearts of each and every one who's here today. You know exactly what they're going through in the conflict that they face. Lord, I pray that your word would have spoken to their heart and that they would not rest until that conflict is settled. I pray that you give them the dependence upon you the right heart and the right mind to, to reach out to that individual or that group 
and work out their differences. Lord, be with them. Go with them so that this would be a, a smooth transition to peace. Thank you, Father, for all that you will do in and through all the conflicts that are in the lives of the body today. And Lord, I want to pray for those who are here who want to establish that hotline, that red phone communication, that relationship with you. Friend, if that's you, just pray this prayer and say out loud, Lord God, I need you. I cannot live without you. I know that I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. I thank you for Jesus Christ who died and gave his life to pay for my sins. Today, Lord, I repent that I receive Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I ask you to come into my life as I surrender and I completely give my life to you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and mercy upon me, Lord. Thank you for your forgiveness and for the gift of eternal life. I love you, Lord. And I pray for all of us, Lord God, that we would be men and women who live in peace, who live in union with you and with others, and that our lives would be a testimony, an example that others may see how you bring peace into life. Lord, you are the one who builds bridges. You are the peacemaker, the peace giver. We give our hearts to you and thank you. And pray all of this in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. God bless you. I love you guys.